everyone. Welcome to this special show, The Rise of Digital Currencies. The cryptocurrencies or the digital currencies are getting a lot of attention worldwide. India saw the Bitcoin premium surge by 300% to the global valuations as a reaction to demonetization that happened on November 8th. Let's welcome in then Vitalik Buterin, who is the co-creator and inventor of Ethereum. He's in India the first time ever for the Blockchain India Summit. Vitalik, hi. Welcome to India and I hope your stay and the trip has been eventful. So how did Ethereum happen and uh, how did you go upon it and how is it different from Bitcoin really? So I uh, first uh, joined the kind of cryptocurrency space or was then just called the Bitcoin space back in 2011. Mm. I found out about Bitcoin on the internet. I thought it was uh, very interesting. And over time, I kind of got more and more into it. I started reading about it, writing about it, uh, building software for it. About two years later, while I was in university, I realized that I was already spending like 30 or 40 hours a week on it. And so I dropped out, went into the space full time. And I uh, spent uh, quite a bit of time looking at all the various projects that people were trying to do in what was back then the Bitcoin space eventually came to realize that there were quite a lot of different kinds of blockchain applications that people were trying to make mm. and that potentially you could use blockchain te technology for a lot of things other than just uh, computer peer money the way that Bitcoin was using it. You could use blockchains for financial agreements, uh, registering various kinds of property, land registry, digital identity management, um, so would you contracts. say it's an improvisation on yeah. Bitcoin, it's a and better, think, safer uh, technology? So the idea basically is, right, that you have Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is peer-to-peer -peer cash, hmm. and then you have te the technology, the blockchain, and the blockchain is necessary for making a peer-to-peer -peer cash system that works. Basically, the blockchain solves a uh, problem that's called a double spending problem, which is that if you try to make a peer-to-peer -peer currency out of just messages being passed to each other over the internet, then I might have 50 rupees. Then I could send you those 50 rupees, but then I could not delete them, and I could send the exact same 50 rupees to someone else. Right. Right? So I could turn 50 rupees into 100 rupees, and mm. you know, rupees would hyperinflate faster than Zimbabwe. <laughs> so the um, idea of a blockchain is this, this kind of common shared record that keeps track of which coins have already been spent, at least in the case of Bitcoin. Hmm. And in the case of Bitcoin, basically, if your coins have already been spent, then it shows up in the blockchain and you can't send the second transaction anymore. I can also buy a fraction of this, or do I have Correct. to buy a full unit? No, so a... Uh, like in the Bitcoin software, the kind of smallest unit that the Bitcoin software recognizes is called a Satoshi. Hmm. And there's 100 million Satoshis in what we call a Bitcoin. Oh, okay. I mean, so, you know, what is the best way of getting into it? I mean, would you say that uh, it, it's a program without any chance of a fraud, third party interference, or is it about censorship? What is the best way to explain this? Right. So, moving on from Bitcoin to Ethereum, first mm -hmm. of all. So, you have blockchain technology, right? And it solves these uh, important problems for Bitcoin. And what I realized was that there were all of these other block applications that potentially could really benefit from the properties that a blockchain has. Right. So, in terms of what properties a blockchain has and what they are, decentralization, fault tolerance, reliability, security, I mean, definitely like resistance to kind of censorship, fraud, and interference. Um, also, just the fact that the system is global. Hmm. So, like with Bitcoin, for example, I can send money from Kyrgyzstan to Guatemala, and it happens just as quickly as sending money to my neighbor. Right. So. The um, idea basically is that you know, with Ethereum, can, can we try and take those same benefits and make those benefits uh, possible to be applied, not just in money, but like, theoretically in anything. But Vitalik, what has been the acceptability over the, around the world? Because we understand that US and China seem to have accepted it much mm -hmm. faster, much better, Russia as well. Mm -hmm. The other countries, what's your feedback from there? It uh, depends. I mean, we often think about like the U.S. and China because they're fairly large and high-profile mm -hmm. countries, and lots of things happen inside of them. But if you look at you know regions like Europe, Southeast Asia, um, South America, you know, like 
a lot in a lot of places uh, it's you have pockets where there is really a lot of attention a lot of excitement then you have other places where there's not that much happening and you know even like in the US it's the same thing you have lots of activity in San Francisco lots of activity in New York but if you go and look at like Detroit based not that much but tell like how old are you uh, and 22 <laughs> yeah. yeah and how long have you been working on this so i discovered bitcoin for the first time back when i was 17 and then mm. uh, came up with the idea for ethereum when i was 19 mm. so 3 years ago mm. but you know also to talk to us about the reaction mm. that you have seen coming mm. from the economists sure. regulators and policy makers yeah. because they have been so going back and forth on this it's definitely mixed I um, mean especially over the last couple of years I've actually been surprised to see that a lot of uh policymakers have actually been quite willing to accept uh, blockchain technology. Hmm. Now with Bitcoin specifically they tend to often be a bit more skeptical because the currency applications are the the place where like some of the like, black market activities that they don't like are concentrated. Hmm. But once you know you explain to them some of the other possibilities like digital identity systems financial contracts um making like government records uh, resistance to tampering you know secure land registries all this other stuff they uh, tends to get very excited mm-hmm. and some of these governments not you know not only are they not banning it some of them are actively subsidizing it <laughs> they are yeah. but you know what are the chances since you are into it you wrote it and you are a co-founder creator there uh, what are the chances of a misuse or uh, we've heard so many instances read about mm-hmm. it being hacked as well so how safe is the technology how would you put that it's uh, definitely early stage mm-hmm. um i mean There is also different layers of the technology, right? So like in the case of Ethereum, you would have the Ethereum core, and the Ethereum core has been I'd say hardened very substantially over the last 4 or 5 months because of the attacks that we've gotten. And you know, we've ended up rewriting a lot of the core code several, several times, and like I'm much more confident in it now than I was half a year ago. If you go up the stack, then one of the challenges that you have is just making sure that the code that people write actually is correct. Mm. Right? So one of the kind of sales pitches of blockchains that you can have code that runs exactly as written and you can't interfere with the way that the code is written. Now, if the code is written in a way that actually reflects the intentions of the people participating in it, then that's a wonderful thing. But if the code has some error in it and that error cause, makes it suddenly very easy for some hacker to just like steal the funds, then that's a different story, huh. right? And uh the it's actually a very challenging problem, right? You know, bridging this kind of gap between intent which is this kind of very fuzzy human thing where we don't even fully understand our own intent a lot of the time and sort of really hard computer code that has to be like exactly formally specified sure. and there are you know, mathematicians computer scientists and a lot of other people have been coming up with a lot of tools over the past 10 or 20 years to try sure. to help bridge the gap but yeah. also there's so many cryptocurrencies at this point mm-hmm. in time and we see some being added uh, at one point or the other mm-hmm. is there space enough around for all of them to exist coexist I mean, you know, realistically you know there are over 1000 cryptocurrencies but over 900 of them they're basically just very fairly boring clones of you know bitcoin or ethereum or clones of other clones of bitcoin hmm. so they just take some existing cryptocurrency change a few parameters and call it an innovation right and uh Like back in 2012, 2013, this was something that could potentially create a new cryptocurrency that was still pretty valuable. Mm-hmm. And if you look at something like Litecoin, which is like one of these just simple parameter changes, you know, it's still got a 150 million dollar market cap. But the uh, systems that people are creating now, like if you look at you know, what's come out over the last year, it's very clear that in order for something new to emerge in 2016 it actually has to have a very substantial amount of new technical innovation behind Your it. Your point is very well taken but on that note we need to take a quick break. We are in conversation with Vitalik Buterin and when we come back we'll of course talk about on how India stands in this line of cryptocurrencies.